Okay, hey guys, it's John here again doing a video for assignment 2 for Comp 1927. And this video will follow on from my last pencast and will basically cover how, uh, how I approached assignment 2 and maybe some tips for those who uh, are just starting the assignment now or perhaps those who don't quite fully understand how the structure of um, code works with assignment 2 because it is a relatively complex code base, but hopefully after this, it should look a lot simpler and less scary to a lot of you. Okay, so to begin with, I'm just going to write a, a very basic FLAN program. So we're gonna have above, one, one, and then in here, we're gonna have a canvas, which is going to be 10, 10, and we'll then have our list, where we'll have a circle of, let's say, a center point which is in the center of our canvas and a radius of 2. Uh, so that's our first picture for the above call. Our second picture for the above call is going to be canvas. We're going to call 1010 again. And here we're just going to include a line um, from 00, zero to uh, well, let's go across the whole the whole breadth. So there we are. There's our basic plan program, and that is essentially how it's written uh, and compiled. So when this compiles, we want it to look something like this. So here's the output SVG. If we draw each of these on their own, so if we were to to draw these on their own, the circle. Well, here's here's our two mini canvases. So this here is 10, and this here is 10, and that's the same for both canvases. So the circle, we have a, uh, a center point just here, and then it's 2, so it's a size of 2. Um, so let's just say that's what our circle looks like on its canvas. So this one here is the circle. And then our line, we know it starts, so this one here, it's going to be our line. We come down here, we know that the first point is at 0, 0, so that's here. We know the second point is at 10, 10. So we know the line is going to look something like this. Now, the output we want to have, so if we look at this entire program, whoop, so if we look at this entire program, we know that we want this to output to an above and above, so we're going to have one picture above, one picture below, and this will distort the original images. So the circle here is nice and round, well, <laughs> it should be nice and round, and the line down here, um, obviously, you know, it, you can see it's a 45 degree angle. So up here, however, when we convert these to above and below, it will actually shrink the size of that. And the reason for this is because the size of this image is, I think by default, it's 400 by 400. So in FLAN, everything is relative sizing. So with our line here, because it's from 0, 0 to 1010, that will go from the bottom left to the to top right of this image. So in this example up here, when we put the line for example, we want the, the line to be in this bottom quadrant. When we put the line, it's going to say, okay, well, we want the, the first point to be in the bottom left part, and we want the second point to be in the top right part. And so that is what we want it to look like once we have put that line into the bottom part. Now, the circle will be slightly different. We want the center point to be in the center of the top up here, and we want it to be size 2. However, as we'll see in a second, the size relative from its canvas is two for the top part of the radius and two for the side part of the radius here. In this, however, two units up is going to be less than what the two units is going to be across. So if we take this 10 here and we then compare that to the 400 up here, it will be two units across is 400 divided by 10, so what's that, 40. Two times that is going to be 80 units across. So it's gonna go 80 units across here. 
Now the top is also two, so we have two points here in a canvas of size 10, so we want to go two points up. However, if you look at this size, this is only 200 along here. Therefore, we go 200 divided by 10, so that's 20. So the two, the radius of two is only going to go up by 20 units up here. So we have, uh, sorry, it'll be size 40 units up here. So we have 40 units, and I'll just draw this in. And don't worry, if it seems confusing right now, the rest of the video, once we get this out of the way, should be relatively easy to understand. So along here, we have 80 units. And up here, we have 40 units. And so the circle itself is going to be distorted and look something like this. And that is the, the final output of our program. We want to have this circle obviously without this green line, and this yellow line down here. And if we can get all of that, then this program has rendered correctly. Now, to do that, we're going to need to discuss uh, one more concept, and there's, there's two ways to render, well, there's, there's two important parts of uh, Flan rendering. So, one of them is the, um, how would you call it? I guess we would say the frame of reference. And the next important thing is the relative size information, or the relative position. Now, these two things are given up here. Oh, sorry, one of these. The relative position is given up here. So the relative position is basically saying circle 5, 5 relative to its canvas of size 10, 10. So that's the relative position. And I'll mark that here just so that at all times we can actually see that. So this relative position, this is where you have this information here. Relative, well, perhaps that's confusing to use tuples. So relative to this size here. Now, the frame of reference is, let's see, I'm running out of colors here. I can use red. So the frame of reference which we have here is now something we're going to discuss. So Flan uses three vectors, and this is actually in Peter Hudson's paper. We have three vectors, one called origin, one called bottom, and one called left. And these three vectors, so just remember that these are, these are vectors. These three vectors basically determine what our frame of reference is. Now, just to give you an example, the origin, when the whole program begins, origin will be 0, 0. And these are two-dimensional vectors as well. So origin is 0, 0, and origin basically says where are we starting, or what is the anchor for our current frame of reference? And this 0, 0 corresponds to the bottom left-hand corner of the current frame of reference. So when you begin, we're starting at the full bottom left part of the SVG image. Now bottom, even though it's a two-dimensional vector, you only use one component, and that is the X component. And that says, how far is the X range of the current frame of reference? So at the beginning, when it first starts, bottom is going to equal 400. So it's saying we can use the entire width of the SVG image here. And left is obviously the, the other complementing vector to that. And when it starts, it is up here, saying that we can use the full height of our SVG image. So when we first start, our frame of reference is the entire image or the entire SVG image. This frame of reference is what we need to change in order to do the assignment tasks. So we don't have to modify, this relative position here will remain fixed and we do not need, we do not need to change any of these values. So where we have up here, we have the canvas 1010, circle 552. None of that is relevant to our program. The canvas call is rendered using a 
uh, f canvas function which has already been implemented for us and it will take all of this information and it will provide it to the the SVG image to record that shape onto um, the file itself. However, for us to use the picture combinators such as above, all we need to do is change the frame of reference. To see how that works, we can take our initial example. So we can see here we had the circle of radius 2 in a can or its relative canvas size was 10 and 10 which produced that nice round circle. When we squished that frame of reference to be only half of uh, our image, we can now see that relative position caused the circle to become distorted and be wider than it was high. So by changing the frame of reference and the only changing the frame of reference, we're able to change the image itself. Uh, okay, so now we need to talk about how do we change this frame of reference so that we can perform the picture combinations that are required for the assignment. There's a range of formulas given in Peter Henderson's PDFs where he goes through and explicitly states the exact mathematical uh, algorithm that you need to apply to these points here. Now, it helps if you know how these are referred to in his PDF paper. So he refers to the origin bottom and left um, essentially as the A, uh, B, and C vectors. He refers to the first picture, which this here is the first picture parameter for the above call. He refers to this as P, and he refers to the second picture in the call here to Q. These two parameters here, which are the relative ratios for the call, he refers to as M and N. He then takes this information and he says that a, a picture P with M, or well actually, let me just rub this out. It's a little confusing having the P on the outside there. So he says that a, a picture, and let's call that pick, of here we are, of M, N, or a picture which is a function of M, N, P, and Q, and the vectors A, B, and C, equals, and he goes on to list um, the changed A, B, C values. So he then says this equals um, A with some operations, B with some operations, and C with some operations. And you'll see that those operations are usually things like um, A plus B or B plus C scaled by M times or M divided by M plus N or, or something of that nature. So you can see here M, N, P, and Q. Uh, a, B, C, and this pick here is essentially just our picture combinators here. So it's a function like above, which takes these parameters and then outputs an image. Now, for us, uh, I don't really need that, do I? For us to change the frame of reference, first we need to pull these values out of the Flan interpreter. So, so far we, we, we know how to uh, change the frame of reference because we've covered Peter Henderson's formulas here. We know that we don't need to change the relative position of the images. So all we need to know is then how to get our M and P and Q out of the, the value underscore T pointer and the render underscore T pointer which is passed into the different combinators. So for this example here, I'm going to use uh, above, however, most of what I'm saying here will apply to any of the render functions or picture combinators. So if we have a look at f above, and let's have a look at some of the, um, the, the, the parameters we get in here. So we get a render t pointer uh, r, and we also get a value t pointer v. Now, 
the render t variable which we have here, this is where we find our frame of reference. So I probably should have written that in red. But it, wherever you see this render t are, it's actually just these three vectors that we can use. So if you go, um, for example, r uh, origin, that is the vector origin or a that we see here. The value underscore t pointer v is essentially just our program from up here. So all of this text, this above 1, 1, canvas, blah, 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 all of this is contained in our value underscore t pointer v. Now you've got to understand that in a Flan program, the user can create their own types, they can create a whole range of functions which you know, can, can render trees or can do all types of things with drawing pictures and what have you. However, once Flan has finished interpreting or passing that program, everything will be broken down into its base elements of the picture combinators that we have to implement. So that is to say that no matter what type of user-defined types there are in the program, everything when it is passed into your functions as a value uh, underscore TV, everything that is in here is one of the defined and included picture combinators like above or rotate or canvas, things like that. So they're the only ones that we need to deal with and it will be in this form here. Uh, importantly to note the canvas call here is the only function which will actually render to the image. So as I stated before you do not need to change or draw, you don't need to render uh, anything at all, you just need to change the frame of reference we've got here. Okay, so now I've probably spoken about that enough. Let's have a look at what we need to do in one of these combination functions in order to pull the parameters that we have here for our M and N and the picture P and picture Q and then change that uh, frame of reference in order to produce the output which we have up here. Now the, the parameter here to any of these functions, this P and this Q, We've got here a very simple uh, example. So it's just a simple canvas call. However, also note that this expression in here can be any picture uh, expression. Any expression that returns a picture is valid syntax to be in these brackets. So that even includes, it could be a, another combination call like F uh, above or F beside, or it could be any uh, rotate, flip, could be a whole range of these. It could be an entire recursive structure of pictures inside this. As long as it eventually evaluates to a picture, then it's valid. However, because of that fact, and because that this expression in here can be quite complex, this is where the recursive rendering uh, thing comes in. So the basic pseudocode for what we want to do here is we want to extract our parameters and that is our M, our N, our P, and our Q. We then want to change the frame of reference. And then that will perform the combination effect and change our image like this. And we then want to recursively render P and Q. So let's just think about what that means for a second. That means that we take this expression inside here, which we've associated as P, and we then call F render on that P after we have um, changed the frame of reference for that expression. If we look at our simple example here and how this works, just at a high level, when we extract the parameters, the M and the N are going to be 1 and 1. And we pull that out just by using uh, a couple of macros, which you'll see in a moment. However, once we pull that off, that's, that's fairly easy to do. The P is pulling off a, uh, or the, the P and Q pulling them out of the parameters. It's just a case of casting that uh, to another value T and then calling F render on it. So that was probably a little confusing. Let me just uh, go over that again. So 
To do this, we've extracted the M and the N from the value TV which we have in here. We've then extracted the pointer to this expression which will be another value T pointer. We then set up our frame of reference for P and we then call F render on P. We then set our frame of reference up for Q and we then call our render our F render on Q. So let's look at how we actually extract and this is probably a question which a lot of people probably have is how do you actually extract these values and these expressions out of value underscore t uh, pointer or the, the pointer t a v. The documentation in parser.h is a little misleading in that it says there is three cases when you can use um, or three cases for what this will actually contain. It doesn't quite work out that way or at least I found uh, it didn't quite work out that way. However, you really only have to use two different macros and well actually there's a few macros, but let's go through the first one. So this value underscore t t uh, v, we want to convert that into a list of parameters. So if we take a list underscore t and we're just going to call that um, list for now, not very exciting. Well actually let, let's call it parameters because that's a little more descriptive about what it's actually going to be. So let's call it params. And this is going to equal, now I'm leaving out some explicit casting here for the sake of cleanliness. However, understand that you will have to cast this to a list pointer when it returns. But just for keeping this nice and brief, I understand that I will be leaving out the, the casting operation. So we call the macro datacon params and we call it on V. And that will return to us a list uh, once we have cast it, it will return us a list and the elements or the nodes of this list are going to be the parameters for the function call. So the first node in this list is going to be our M. The second node in this list is going to be our N and so on and so forth. M and N or all numerical parameters are stored in Flan as a double. So if we want to pull out our M, we can say double M equals and we now use numval and we need to call that on the list nth of params and we say okay well what part of our list is m in okay well it's in the first position here so we know computer science we start counting at zero so this basically says double m we want to equal and numval here will extract a number out of uh, a, well essentially a value t pointer this list nth here needs to be cast to a value t pointer as that's what it returns and numval will take a value t pointer and it will then extract the double that's inside it uh, at least that's if I remember correctly I haven't checked over my code but I'm always certain this is the way it works List nth will index into our any list structure here. So in this case, we're using parameters or params, and it will extract the the node or the element of that list which you specify. So by specifying zero, it will return the first element in the list. By doing this, we now have the value one stored in M, and you can do this exactly the same way for N. However, this zero becomes a one to extract the second element in the list. Now the more exciting one. We, we now need a value t pointer because that is the form that our expressions take. So all of this, uh, if you think of it, all of this program code, everything is in collections of value t pointers. So our value t pointer here, uh, we're going to call this p. And this is going to equal, and once again, we have to cast this to a value t pointer. However, we don't need numval, we can just go straight to the list nth and I need to learn how to spell properly. So the list nth of params and we now want the, the, the second which is going to give us the third element and this entire expression here this is all one element so this is our third element here and it's literally it will just contain all of these elements elements just like we have with the above call and then inside canvas it will extract the 10 and the 10 the exact same way that we extracted the m and the n for this call so think of it as just like a tree of different function calls 
Now, we do that exact same process to extract our queue, except the two is obviously going to become a three, and we now have all the information we need in order to change the frame of reference and uh, recursively render P and Q. This is now where we set the frame of reference for P. And just to note as well, some of this can be done in multiple ways, so however you choose to implement it is, is fine with you. And I'm not going to go through all the specific details because um, I feel this, uh, well basically I, I don't want anyone to just blindly copy this, they need to understand what they're doing. Um, and I think that this is a high, le high level enough discussion where you won't be able to take this and just complete the assignment, but I think this will give you um, the, the basis of knowledge that you need to actually apply this. And particularly, this is only covering the one combination function. This is very similar to a lot of the other ones, so beside is almost a direct um, duplicate of the above type code, but obviously the frame of reference calculation will be different. And um, obviously the functions like rotate and flip, which only use one picture parameter, will be different to this. But here is where we set the frame of reference for P, and we then call fRender to recursively render P. And then, as we spoke about before, we set the frame of reference for Q, and we then recursively render Q. That is, in a nutshell, pretty much everything you need to know to get stuck straight into assignment two and to start um, smashing out those picture combination functions. I hope this has been useful to, to some people just to get their head around what the code in the Flange interpreter and Flange is doing. There is a lot more in there than what I've covered right now, but I encourage you um, just as a, a few tips. Actually, I might even, let's see. I will just get, I'll just erase some of this. So you can go back in the video if you want to see it. I just want to write a couple of um, tips for if you find yourself getting stuck, then there are a few key places to look. So there's a lot of code that we've been uh, given. However, not all of it is relevant to what you'll be doing. Particularly files like lexa.c, you, you don't want to look in that file because it will scare you. It scared me when I had a look at it. And that's because it's an automatically generated file. Nothing in there is of relevance to us. However, files like um, list.h, it's an interesting file. However, once again, because it's an ADT, you don't have to have any idea of how it works internally in order to use it in the assignment. Um, so here's, as soon as my pen decides that it doesn't want to be an eraser anymore, Okay, so here's uh, a few tips on what to do if you feel like you're getting stuck. The number one thing which I found is print value is an invaluable function. So that takes a value t, and this here is, it, it will help you visualize what actually is happening uh, in this step here and how this corresponds to your parameters in each function call. If you, in the previous example where we extracted the value of P and Q out of value TV, if you put P and Q into print value, you will see that it will print out the expression of P and Q. And uh, if you find yourself getting stuck, play around with print value to see exactly how V is structured and how V changes when you point to different elements inside of V. The second one is, do the, the shape functions first. So I haven't covered any of that in this video, but it uses the same principles. And if you apply the parameter extraction, as we saw in this video, to the render shape function, then I think you'll find it's not too difficult to get those out. The only thing which might trip you up is how to use tuples. And there is another um, macro called tupleval, which works exactly the same way as numval, except this will return uh, a list type. So a tuple is nothing more than a list where you can then, using the, the process we saw here, you can then call numval on this list using listNth to extract the different numbers out of that list of the tuple. 
after you've gotten the tuple out of V in the first place. So I, I say do the, do the shape render functions first because once you have um, render line and render circle, you can actually run the first couple of FLAMP programs with your flange.c file and see those lines and those circles being drawn. You won't be able to use any of the combinators, but just getting something rendered early on is good for motivation and uh, will also help you understand how the underlying renderer works. The I should probably stick with the same convention. Uh, the probably the last tip which I have is if you find oh, I guess keep it simple uh, is one I want to put here. If you find that you're getting bogged down in the assignment and you're not really sure what's happening, just come back to some of these initial thoughts. So look at print value, um, look at this diagram up here and try and understand what value t is actually giving you and try and understand how the relative sizing and position of a recursive renderer works. Uh, well, for example, for this SVG type renderer where how, in fact, even draw it out. Um, have a look at an image and then draw out each individual picture in its own box and then put it together here and work out what the mathematical calculations are using the formula that will produce the design output. And if you can draw this picture here first, keep it simple, so say so keep it simple and, and draw expected output. Uh, and if you can draw it here and work out what these numbers need to be, then it's a simple process of going into um, your, your program code and working out how you get those values. Um, so that's pretty much all I wanted to cover. Uh, if anyone else has any questions, feel free to put them up on the forums, or if I've said anything which is incorrect here, please let me know so I can rectify that. Uh, but apart from that, good luck with the assignment, and I hope everyone's going well. Happy coding, and, and hope you enjoyed your long weekend. Catch you guys later. Bye.